This afternoon we have a jam-packed program. We're going to give you an overview of research funded by the MSA Coalition over the past five years. We're going to look at what's interesting in the MSA treatment pipeline, how you can get involved in research and the importance of brain donation. We're going to end up discussing where the MSA Coalition will focus their research spending over the next few years. It's really a pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker who's joined us all the way from Innsbruck, Austria. He saw his first MSA patient in medical school in 1987, over 30 years ago. And he committed back then to begin working on understanding this disease and hopefully finding a cure. He works harder than anyone else I know to raise the profile of MSA among the research and medical community, having delivered over 300 invited lectures on MSA at medical and scientific conferences. He's published over 600 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and has published the first ever medical textbook on multiple system atrophy. He's been a member of our scientific advisory board since 2013, and I'm really happy to announce his recent appointment as chair. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Gregor Venning. Uh, Pam, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, this is the first annual meeting that I participated in, and I'm really overwhelmed by the hospitality and by all the activities that are ongoing here, combining patient needs and scientific progress. So I'm, I've been asked to highlight a few of the coalition-funded projects. This is from the SEED program. And then I will finish with uh, a treatment pipeline. These are actually slides that I had also used in the Movement Disorder Congress in Nice just prior to this meeting. So um, basically when looking at uh, the uh, f projects that, that uh, have been supported over the year, um, I think it is impressive that there were 136 applications coming from big sites, big uh, PIs in the field. 36 were selected for support, uh, totaling um, $1.6 million. As far as I know, this is uh, globally the largest effort coming from a patient support group to um, um, fund research, and I think you are all applauded um, for this uh, very important and continuing um, support. This is just showing you when the one million milestone was um, passed um, in 2016, some key members there. These 36 grants uh, went to 25 institutions in nine countries. It really is a global effort. I think um, the coalition has matured into a, a global initiative and uh, many of the PIs present in this meeting have had the benefit of um, the coalition support. We will hear about the global MSA registry, which is a re really important uh, um, initiative uh, that allows patients to be enrolled uh, and um, I think it's about close to 1,000 patients that have been registered here. We will hear about this from uh, Lucy Kaufman in a, in a minute. So let's uh, go into some of the um, projects that have been supported. This is just to remind ourselves about the fundamental problem of MSA, which is that of the uh, progression uh, of the disease. It kind of starts at a premotor level when there is involvement of bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, orthostatic hypotension. There may be stridor in some patients as well. This is then followed by a phase uh, that the criteria label possible MSA when there is Parkinson's and cerebellar ataxia. 
And then um, uh, when the full house of, uh, um, or the full manifestations of MSA develop, there are milestones um, that complicate the presentation. Patients may need a catheter. Speech uh, can deteriorate. Some patients require gastrostomy and so on. There may be issues with uh, lung infections and so forth. We all know about this. And it's extremely important that we not only focus on the symptomatic therapies that are available to alleviate some of these symptoms, but on trying to modify the disease progression, disease modification in MSA. That's the magic word and we need to move towards that. So the first project I would like to highlight uh, was led by Virginia Lee as a PI in Pennsylvania. And uh, based on this uh, project addressing the uh, pathogenesis of, of MSA, she was awarded a $3 million breakthrough prize in 2020. Um, the, gr the grant was awarded to her uh, co-worker Chao Peng and what did they kind of publish in a very prestigious journal, Nature is actually the highest impact uh, journal that you could uh, publish and so basically for some time we, we have known that in MSA brains there is a buildup of synuclein accumulation in glial cells a bit different to Parkinson's disease where these inclusions form in the nerve cells. So in MSA it's the glial cells and we never quite understood why that is. Why are the glial cells, the support cells in the brain, why do they take up all this synuclein? And in this study that um, Chao Peng did under the supervision of Virginia Lee, they established that there are some um, endogenous factors in glial cells that basically govern the formation of the synuclein inclusions in this cell type. They didn't know quite which factors they are, but they were able to, to um, you know, demonstrate that these glial cells have something in common that drives the formation of this toxic synuclein buildup, which is at the root of the problem in this uh, disease MSA. Um, another project supported by the coalition went to Vic Kurana, who is uh, currently uh, uh, in the board of directors of the MSA coalition. He created a stem cell based therapeutic platform for MSA and this was a fundamental work of fundamental importance in MSA uh, treatment strategies. So he was also awarded for this work with the inaugural Bishop Dr. Karl Golze Award which is globally the only scientific award that um, goes to research in MSA and PSP to distinguished scientists. So on that picture you can see Bishop Golzer who suffered atypical Parkinsonism and died from it and I had the pleasure to accept an invitation to act as the president of this foundation that gives away the award. On the left side is a famous neuropathologist Gabor Kovac who spends a lot of time studying the brains of patients with atypical Parkinsonism. So this is the work that Vic published um, and so he is trying to establish the way cells communicate um, through distinct cellular processes to build up synuclein and trying to identify targets for intervention. Very important work. This is another project uh, by Manu Sharma, who is a PhD. He is an expert in neurogenetics and he works in the famous uh, in, uh, Clinical Brain Research Institute, Hertie Stiftung, Hertie Institute in Tübingen in Germany. And he, through a big network invo involving many 
uh, investigators active in MSA research established a sh um, some shared gene loci between inflammatory bowel disease and MSA risk. So that's an interesting topic that will be followed up in the future. It may indicate that inflammation in the bowel is important not only for Parkinson's disease but, but also for MSA. Another project that was funded went to Roy Freeman, uh, Harvard Medical School, for his um, exciting work on cutaneous alpha-synuclein deposition in MSA. So he established that these cutaneous skin biopsy-based synuclein deposits can separate MSA patients from healthy subjects and PD patients and he received an award by the American Academy of Neurology. And again, this just shows you the type of, of work on MSA that was selected uh, for support really has fundamental repercussions, not only within the uh, individual uh, research group, but it's actually signposted for further awards, as, as you can see here in multiple fashion. So next uh, pro project went to Galbitan in Los Angeles who developed a new diagnostic test um, that uh, picks up alpha-synuclein in the blood from MSA patients and he compared that to PD and healthy controls and he could actually correctly uh, diagnose MSA with almost 100% accuracy comparing PD and MSA as you see on the right side there are elevated levels in MSA so basically it is important to develop biomarkers for MSA not just relying on clinical scales and this points us in into the right direction one of the projects went to Innsbruck where we have a special interest in MSA for many years since I came there in 94. We've seen hundreds of patients with um, MSA and more recently we established a gate lab. So basically we are using sensors to um, um, develop outcome measures for intervention. And in this study here, using these sensors that we got from a group in Erlangen, which is in Bavaria, in Germany, where they have a lot of experience with this, we were able to separate based on these sensor signatures. While the patients were walking, we were able to separate them from atypical Parkinson's disease. And so I'm, I'm happy to announce here today that on the basis of this work, we have now been able to successfully show positive benefits from physiotherapy on gait disorder in MSA. This is a paper by Cecilia Racani, who is co-PI here, um, that is coming out in, in, in the journal Parkinsonism and Related Disorder. I would like to close here with a brief uh, summary of these highlights and I would like now to go into the therapeutic pipeline, what do we have, what is available, and I would all um, like to draw your attention that this kind of pipeline you can actually download from the MSA Coalition website. It's been kind of uh, built with the help of, of Pem Bauer, who spent a lot of time here. So part of the preclinical drug discovery programs include Exandin 4. This is a grant that was awarded to Vasilius Meissner, who is one of the leading European MSA experts. This is an FDA approved drug for treating diabetes. And there are many studies, experimental studies, that show that insulin resistance occurs in the brains of MSA patients and may mediate the pathology there. And he has been able to show in this coalition supported project that Exandin 4 reduces the nuclein levels in the brain and ameliorates nerve cell death in MSA mice. This is the next uh, preclinical uh, project where a grant was awarded to Nadia Stefanova in the Innsbruck Neurobiology Lab and Galbitan again. They looked at a new compound, it's called a molecular tweezer, 
CLR01, and they found that this molecular tweezer that cuts off certain parts of the synuclein protein and makes it kind of digestible to the um, uh, phagocytic pathways in the cells that this can actually reduce the toxic synuclein levels in the mouse brain and, in, uh, and reduce behavioral abnormalities. So an interesting approach and it calls for translational activities with drug companies now. Another study that was funded uh, involved Fingolimod. Fingolimod is an FDA improve, approved drug for treating multiple sclerosis. This grant was awarded to Ruth Paris and it was um, this compound was uh, examined in MSA experimental mouse models at the Texas Tech University Health Science Center. So basically, they were able to show that neuroinflammation, which plays an important part in MSA brain pathology, can be reduced. So if you're able to initiate this early on, you may be able to rescue the nerve cells in MSA brains. Now, this is uh, a study or project uh, where a grant was awarded to Eliza Maslaya. I think he is one of the key people in the field of neurodegeneration based at NIH, where he heads the Alzheimer Parkinson program, and he's always had an interest in MSA. He's published repeated studies there. And in this project, an interesting project, he combined two different approaches to hit the synuclein toxicity. So basically, he combined an alpha-synuclein antibody and an anti-inflammatory drug and showed that he was able to reduce the inflammation, the pathological synuclein accumulation, and he was also able to improve the motor deficits in this uh, mouse model. So maybe in the future, what we might see, what might be necessary, like in oncology, is not to rely only on one therapeutic strategy. You may need to combine two or maybe even three that, ha that hit different targets. This is another study that was supported uh, by a grant to Eliza Maslaya, looking at calicrein 6. This is an enzyme that cleaves alpha-synuclein in the brain, makes it more less toxic. And again, in this project, he was able to show beneficial effects <coughs> in the MSA mouse model. Um, next, a compound, nilotinib, that you may have heard of, um, in, the re in relation to Parkinson's disease trials, where it's currently assessed. It's a chemotherapy drug. This uh, project went to Pierre-Olivier Fernagu and Vassilios Meissner in the Bordeaux group. For those of you who don't know this, the French have a national network for MSA, and that's based in Bordeaux. They have several hundreds of patients that they follow there. So they are very strong in MSA research. So basically, this compound is currently tried in PD in a phase 2A. But um, so far, it, it has failed to show positive effects in the MSA mice. So we kind of don't know how this goes on. We may have to um, forget about it, um, but um, we will see. Now, let me just mention to you some of the trials that have been performed. This was just preclinical experimental work that I have shown you supported by the coalition. This is the EGCG trial. This is a trial that was conducted in Germany with 10 uh, about 10 centers recruiting MSA patients on the basis that EGCG as a green tea extract inhibits synuclein buildup in the brains of MSA models. So basically this was a phase two, three trial in about 100 patients and they were not able to detect any effects on disease progression and there was an issue with liver side effects in some of the high dose uh, patients. 
but they were able to show that MRI markers of disease pathology were positively influenced by the treatment with ECGC. Another trial that is currently kind of ongoing by Biohaven involves Verdiperstat. This is the M-STAR trial. Biohaven took over this compound from AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca had done a phase two trial with some uh, positive effects in clinical scores. Uh, Vertibestat is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor. So what does it mean? This is an enzyme that increases inflammation in MSA brains, also in Parkinson's disease brains. So if you inhibit um, this uh, enzyme, uh, you can deliver this compound orally, so it's a pill that you have to take. You can reduce inflammation in the brain, and if you are lucky, you can rescue nerve cells. On the basis of the phase two trial that was done by Astra, a phase three trial program is currently in, in progress in the US and in Europe. And this will be the largest ever MSA trial performed in the history. So in terms of sheer numbers that are involved. And it's an activity at the global level. Now I just want to mention a couple of small studies because they can also be helpful to open your eyes, you know, what may be useful in the future. Both of them are by Dr. Novak. This is a study uh, using immunoglobulins, intravenous infusions, again to reduce neuroinflammation. And the results were that this administration was safe in MSA patients and well tolerated, but we don't have any convincing data on clinical effects of this. This is another one published by Dr. Novak uh, with intranasal insulin. Insulin has vasodilatatory and neurotrophic effects. Uh, and a phase two trial in PD and MSA subjects was recently completed by Dr. Novak. The conclusion is, again, this is safe and tolerated well, but we don't have any convincing data um, on therapeutic effects. This st um, study here, Sirolimus, is a phase two trial by the New York University group, Horatio Kaufman, Lucy Kaufman, Alberto Palma. It's an immunosuppressant. Repamycin is an immunosuppressant used in oncology that enhances autophagy. That means it enhances the degradation of the toxic synuclein um, inclusions. It rescues nerve cells, but it doesn't seem to affect motor behavior beneficially in MSA mice. It reduces synuclein aggregates, and so this phase two trial is currently ongoing. As far as Horatio told me, recruitment is pretty good, and they will definitely be able to answer the question whether there are any promising signals with this. Now let me mention the coenzyme Q10 story. Most of you probably know that MSA is a sporadic disease. It seems that we don't have any links from, uh, or clues from the genetic field that may change though. Uh, in Japan, in six years ago, they discovered the first mutation in some small families uh, that can actually cause MSA in that population. So these are very small families, autosomal recessive, so usually brothers and sisters affected. Uh, but they had a clear link that these mutations in the coenzyme Q2 gene cause MSA. So the result of that was that the levels of coenzyme Q10 which is at the end of that cascade, are reduced. Coenzyme Q10 is an important part of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. So if you don't have coenzyme Q10 levels sufficient in your brain, that causes neurodegeneration. So on the basis of that, 
Uh, we also have some studies in Parkinson's disease using coenzyme Q10. On the basis of that, the Japanese investigators decided to go ahead with a phase two clinical trial of coenzyme Q10 in MSA of the cerebellar presentation, which is the more common one in Japan. So this is quite exciting, I think. This is ongoing. Another exciting development is um, the immunization. There is the possibility to immunize the body against synuclein, um, stimulating antibody formation. These antibodies against synuclein then enter the, or pass the blood-brain barrier and they may be able to stimulate the removal of synuclein aggregates in the brain. So basically, uh, together with some clinical sites in Europe and a company in Vienna called Afiris. Um, there were two trials initiated, one in Parkinson's disease and one in MSA, a smaller one in MSA. And it seems that it is possible to stimulate antibody production by this approach, which is subcutaneous injection of the epitope, so synuclein deposits uh, subcutaneously stimulates the nuclein antibodies. So it's a safe procedure. You can actually get detectable synuclein antibodies. The phase one trial in MSA was positive, and the phase two trial, um, there is a discussion with the company whether that goes on or not. A decision has not been made yet. I would like to mention this study here, mesenchymal stem cells. You probably heard that in Korea six years ago there was the only positive trial in MSA published using mesenchymal stem cells that were infused into the arteries and intravenously. And they were able to show that patients who had that stem cell treatment didn't progress so rapidly compared to uh, patients that didn't receive, that just received saline injections. So on the basis of, these, of this study back in 2012, the Mayo Clinic decided to go ahead with a small phase one safety trial to check whether these mesenchymal stem cells, when delivered intrathecally, so not into the vessels, but by lumbar puncture, so they, these patients got a lumbar puncture in the Mayo Clinic and they had these stem cells administered, whether well, that's safe and tolerated. And this, this has just been recently reported in the journal Neurology. It seems to be safe and they had some evidence that clinical markers were positively influenced. The only issue that they um, kind of um, reported that might be of concern these lumbar punctures can lead to local inflammation due to the cells that are injected there. And some of the patients had pain, like uh, you know, lumbar pain or shooting radicular pain. So this is really something that we need to look out for. Currently, the Mayo Clinic people are, um, have filed for a big proposal to establish for sure whether the stem cells are working or not. So this is something ongoing. Another um, intervention I want to mention here, I'm almost done, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, is PBT434. It's a compound that works both on iron and synuclein. There is a lot of iron in MSA brains and iron can be toxic, so basically, it makes sense, uh, you know, to address the issue of iron toxicity in MSA. So with this compound, you have a double hit. It can reduce toxic iron buildup, and by doing so, it can reduce the nuclein as well. A phase one trial has recently been completed, and there were no issues uh, regarding safety and tolerable, uh, tolerability. One other compound, and that could be a magic compound, uh, that's uh, NLE138B, and we have been involved in Innsbruck in the development of this closely. This is a compound 
that was um, uh, discovered by a Munich group, by neuropathologists in Munich, Professor Giese. Um, he um, kind of uh, found this compound and he was able to show that anli 138 b stops synuclein from building up in brains, in brain models of Parkinson's disease, MSA that's worked together with us, and also prion disease. It seems to be a global, if you want, Mr. Proper. You know, if, I don't know whether you have that here. What's that? Mr. Clean. Mr. Clean. So, <laughs> in Europe, it's called Mr. Proper. So, Mr. Clean. So, it really stops the buildup of aggregated synuclein. And we have very powerful preclinical data that it works in MSA models. So, I'm pleased to announce here that um, money has been collected. Um, they started a small company. And they have close to $20 million um, now to stage a phase 1-2 program with this compound. I'm very excited about this. This is my summary slide that just shows you uh, on, the, on the X axis different compounds in their different phases, preclinical phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, or on the market. And Y axis is, uh, you know, levels of success so far, is it promising or maybe not so promising? And as you can see here, on the top I put anli 13 b I don't know whether you can see that, that's the second uh, uh, circle in blue um, on the top, on the right. So very promising preclinical uh, data and we need to go into phase one and see how that works out. Um, I told you all about the e EGCG story, the green tea that's kind of phase three down below, where we didn't have a clinical impact, but at least we were able to influence MRI changes in the MSA brains. Let me just finish this here by saying that uh, there are also initiatives to work on synuclein antibodies, I mentioned immunization against synuclein, that's active immunization, but there are also programs of, uh, on passive immunization referring to alpha-synuclein antibodies. So there is some data out there as well. So as you can see, when I started 25 years ago, I would have presented you just zero. There would have been nothing. And now, you have a long list of, uh, of compounds under development and I, I think that list wouldn't be there if you hadn't supported this program uh, with all the different seed projects and Vikurana is going to tell you about the future there. I think we are in a position now to crack MSA if we follow the right um, uh, strategies and if we listen to uh, people like Vic or Daniel or anybody here in the field uh, interested in interventional therapies. I have been asked to talk a little bit about uh, cautions regarding stem cell trials. So FDA, they, um, 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 you know, they are very critical about this now. If there is no definite development program, they don't want to, uh, you know, mention this or stop these interventions even. Um, Google plans to ban ads for stem cell therapies. I just want to remind you when the Koreans did the stem cell study in 2012, I was flooded with email requests by European MSA patients, where can I get this treatment and I want to get it done. And then I usually told them, well, it will cost you $30,000 you can get it maybe in China or India, uh, but I would not really go for it if it's outside a scientific protocol. But these patients still went there, being desperate and so on. And I think it's necessary for us clinicians or clinician investigators to highlight the potential dangers if this is offered outside of scientific protocols, it should not be pursued. So basically there is also advice 
uh, if you're considering treatment in the US, FDA has reviewed all these sites. You can get information. If you go to other countries, as I mentioned before, I would really stay clear of that. So this is where we go. As I mentioned before, in the middle, this was all absent 25 years ago. There was no hope for nothing. And now we have big hopes, and I think it's important for us as clinicians who know about the disease and scientists who've been uh, working on these preclinical screens that we get together with the drug industry and develop the best possible protocols that give us the best answers for the problems. So with that I would highlight the Innsbruck MSA group. We've recently started a dysautonomia center. I want to acknowledge the support over the years by the MSA coalition, but there's also a lot of infrastructure support both by the university in Innsbruck and the uh, hospital administration. Thank you.